Hello, I'm Ritala Shah. Welcome to this University of Exeter event. It's part of the European Researchers Night project, which is funded by the European Commission under the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions. At the end of tonight's discussion, there's a very quick poll that'll pop up with five questions. If you've got a minute, please let us know what you think about this event. It'll really be appreciated. Tonight is about unpacking riddles, the politics, psychology and communication of climate change. Our speakers will talk about how scientists communicate their work through the media and engage their work with politicians. And while climate change may be climbing up the political agenda, the fact remains that we address lesser but still serious threats with more urgency. Why is that? That's what I hope we'll get to in some shape or form tonight. Our speakers then. Professor Richard Betts is a lead author on the fourth, fifth and sixth assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change. He's head of the Climate Impact Strategic Area at the Met Office and chairing climate impacts at the University of Exeter. Grace Blakely is an economist and journalist. She's the author of Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization, and she's a staff writer at the Tribune. Dr. Catherine Butler is a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter. Her work examines processes of environmental governance, focusing on two major substantive themes, energy and low carbon transitions, and flooding and climate change adaption. Chris Demere is a research fellow in neuroscience and a visiting lecturer at the Department of Geography. He specializes in how people become entrenched in their beliefs and how this leads to polarization in society. Robert Pollan is Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and founding co-director of its Political Economy Research Institute. He's just written a book called Climate Crisis and the Green New Deal with Noam Chomsky, who spoke for us here at Agile Rabbit back in September. Welcome to you all. Let's get going without further ado. Richard Betts, if I can begin with you. During the first lockdowns, emissions actually were 17% lower, but that had really very little overall impact on CO2 concentration. Do you think the public accepts that individual actions don't have enough effect and then actually what needs to happen is wider international systemic changes? The, uh, I think the public uh, do get uh, the fact that a combination of uh, individual action and system level change uh, is needed. Everyone kind of understands that they personally have uh, some kind of in influence uh, on the environment, but they also understand uh, that some of that influence uh, comes down to what they choose to do and how they do it, but also they're constrained by the system itself. Uh, uh, so yeah, where we get our energy from, we have limited choices on that. How we get around uh, transport wise, we have some choice, but it's also it was sort of limited uh, as well. So it's a combination, I think. So people, I think people get it, uh, but I think there's also perhaps a frustration as to people often don't understand what needs to be done to really break out of this issue, I think. So let's lay out the groundwork a little bit more. Under the trajectories of current modelling, how long do you think that climate remains in our control to allow societies, as we recognise them, things to remain pretty much the same? Um, well, uh, climate is already uh, changing because of our impact on it. Uh, we are already having to adjust to some extent, or at least we do need to start adjusting to some extent, uh, probably more than we actually are doing to live with the changes. Um, however, we haven't sort of set off any kind of you know, runaway, uh, uncontrollable climate change uh, yet. And we may not, in fact, we may not do for uh, a, a long time, um, but that's no cause for, uh, for complacency uh, because, uh, the, the things that are already starting to happen in terms of extreme events and rising sea levels will happen more frequently and become more severe uh, in the near uh, and, and, and medium term. Um, I think in terms of how we, how long we have, it's, it's, you can't really put a sort of you know, firm time scale on it. Basically, uh, we need to reduce our impact on, on the climate as urgently as we can and every uh, Every piece of action helps, uh, and the sooner we start, the better, really. Bob Pollin, I wonder what you think about that. Uh, hi. First, thank you all for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, I want to just mention, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, 
the International Energy Agency, which is the biggest agency doing energy and emissions modeling, um, they estimate uh, in their most recent model that if all the countries in the world followed uh, the Paris Agreement, the 2015 Paris Agreement, uh, emissions wouldn't go down at all uh, through 2040. Their model ends in 2040, at least their most recent model. Um, emissions would keep going up, even if every country agrees, uh, adheres to everything they agreed to in Paris. Uh, now, we already know, first of all, that the Paris Agreement is voluntary, and we already know that under our uh, current U.S. president, who hopefully will be gone in two months, um, uh, they, he, 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 got us, he got the U.S. out of it altogether. So uh, I think that um, the level of commitment um, as expressed, I mean, the Paris Agreement was uh, historic in some sense, 195 countries involved. Um, we are not close to any level of uh, hitting the emission reduction targets set out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that Professor Betts is part of. And those targets are on CO2, 45% reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So the level of commitment, in my view, uh, has to be uh, much more intense. And it, and it should have started years ago. I agree with Professor Betts that there is still time to get onto a, a stabilization trajectory, but it is going to take a uh, much more serious commitment. Uh, do, do you take any heart from the fact that China is now prioritizing climate change? I, of course, uh, yes, and, but they are saying they aren't gonna even reduce emissions till 2030. I mean, the, their trajectory is uh, still to see emissions go up until 2030. On the other hand, probably one of the, if not the most uh, significant developments towards a climate stabilization path is that the cost of generating electricity from solar panels, from uh, solar energy, has come down by like 75, 80% in just eight years. And that's almost entirely due to innovations in China. So I think China uh, should really start buying its own solar panels and putting them up and stop burning coal. Catherine Butler, I'm gonna bring you in here. Are you any more optimistic about our implementation of international agreements as they stand and, and the impact they might have on climate change? Oh, you need to unbeat yourself as well. Ah, sorry, um, uh, I, I think, I think there is cause to be somewhat more optimistic about Paris, um, potentially. I completely agree with what uh, Bob is saying. Um, the uh, commitments that con most countries have made so far aren't nearly enough um, to address, to do what we need to do. Um, but um, the, I think the key is it's a Paris agreement and what it was successful at doing was getting 195 countries around the world to commit to taking action on climate change in some form. So. Um, obviously the nature of those plans and whether or not they're ambitious enough is, um, is, is, is debatable and, and they are certainly um, not ambitious enough yet. Um, but the fact that so many um, nations are actually putting in place plans is going to drive action on the ground. So I think that that is a positive to take from this. And it is obviously um, an incredibly complex thing to get so many uh, international uh, to get an international agreement like this in place. So, um, ah, I'm frozen. Keep talking, I think we're still hearing you. Can you still hear me? You're still hearing me, good. Um, sorry, um, the joys of the internet. Um, so, uh, yes, in, in, in essence, I think it's, it's a positive that we have got this international agreement in place, and there are lots of other things going on in the world as well. It's not just about um, nat national governments taking action. Um, there's action going on between cities, global cities. Um, there's lots of action going on bottom up from, from the ground as well. So, Chris, I'm going to bring you in. We heard some, uh, some positive views, some much less positive views there. There are the statistically, all the research suggests that the percentage of Americans who believe that climate change will be a personal risk to them in their lifetime has gone up from 40% to 60% in about the last 10 years. 
So what would you say is the relationship between how we perceive the risk, how we perceive the threat to ourselves and the kind of research that's going on? So certainly, uh, as you say, risk, so the perception of risk has been going up. And in a lot of other countries outside of the US, it's actually higher. People see it much more as a, as a threat to themselves and, and, and their communities. So in the UK, it stands at about 85% versus the 60% of the US. And most of that is actually not so much because of the research and the communication about it, but because of the actual visual things that are happening in the world around us, the extreme weather events that are really starting to grab the headlines. Now, interestingly, um, despite the fact that that concern is going up, behavior isn't really changing, actions aren't really changing. And that's because uh, an accurate perception of the risk doesn't automatically lead to climate action. And one of the reasons is what Richard already pointed at it, is that often people don't know what it is that they have to be doing. So we hear in the, the interactions that we have with different people more and more the question, but what can I do about climate change? So there's a real lack of what psychologists call agency, which is an ability to act on climate change, which doesn't only play out with individuals and their own carbon footprint, but also plays out in how people in professional positions are struggling to bring climate change into their professional identities. And that's one of the issues that we really need to start working on. But I do see more and more um, initiatives happening in this space. And, and whereas 2019 was the year of, of eco-anxiety and 2020 will be always known as the year of COVID, I think 2021 is going to be from the year of climate action and people developing a stronger sense of agency. So I think that feeling of despondency that sat with us in, in 2018 and 2019 is going to start reducing and more and more people are going to find a way of becoming active in this space um, and, and beyond their role as consumers. Basically. Catherine Butler, I wonder what you think about this interaction of research and public opinion and how attitudes are or aren't changing. Um, yeah, I think um, it's in terms of the question between attitudes and action, um, I think that the challenges of people acting on climate change, I always put this to climate scientists, like, well, are, are you doing um, what, you, what you think we should be doing to address climate change? And in most cases, we're not. And so, you, you, you know, obviously our attitudes and our knowledge of climate change are very extensive and, and hopefully accurate. Um, and yet we still don't find ourselves able um, to act in the ways that we know we, know we need to. So I think this is about the problem of climate change being so systemic it's so ingrained in absolutely everything we do um, from the food we eat to um, you know how we travel and how we um, uh, sit in our homes right now on the internet and um, uh, with all the lights on so it's it's finding ways to address it as an individual is actually incredibly difficult um, and that's why it needs to be a combination of um, system level changes to then that are then facilitated by and enacted by people at individual levels but you simply aren't able to address climate change um, because it's so ingrained in absolutely everything we do across our society as an individual on your own. I'm keen to bring Grace Blakely in but Robert Pollan if I can go back to you for a moment the point that Krista Mayer made about 2019 being the year of, uh, of climate anxiety 2020 being the year of the pandemic and 2021 perhaps being the year of climate action. I mean, is that, is that how you would see it? Would you frame it in that way? Certainly we've got uh, the big COP26 meeting in December, the end of this year, we're going to mark the anniversary of Paris. There are events on the horizon that are going to keep it up there in the headlines. Uh, I mean, I, I hope that's true. I certainly hope that's true. And, you know, it's up to people being mobilized. I think, okay, and I'm sitting here in the US. I'm actually in Washington, D.C. myself right now. Um, the fact that we have a new administration that is not denying climate change, that is not ridiculing the science, that is not aggressively eliminating regulations that would help on in behalf of climate stabilization is, going, is a very positive thing, despite limitations I see in the administration. Um, that's going to be positive. But, you know, the real action is going to come from the grassroots. I mean, I... I think you know the the work of the young people, starting with Greta Thunberg, and uh, and forcing all of us to confront the problem uh, in a profound way. Uh, that is really what is going to uh, move the dial in terms of 
political action. I mean, you know, I, just as one small example, the head of the uh, European Central Bank, uh, the new one, Christina Lagarde, when she came in last December, I was quite impressed by her statement. She said, climate is going to be my top priority. Well, what does central bankers have to do with climate issues? Well, that alone is a big development. But uh, looking at what she's done, she's been in now for, you know, eight, nine months. And yes, it's been the year of COVID. Not that much. So what we need to do, I mean, the Christina Lagarde's of the world, she said, I have to do this because I can't look my children and grandchildren in the face otherwise. That was a beautiful statement. But that was just what it was, a beautiful statement. So we need to force uh, politicians at all levels, not just at the national level, to really take action and make commitments. And that's where things will start to change. So perfect moment to bring Grace Blakely in. Uh, Grace, so just on that Christine Lagarde, I mean, I've heard Christine Lagarde speak very, very powerfully, actually, about climate change. Uh, is it fair? Shouldn't we assume that central bankers like her are, are working behind the scenes to make things happen? Is it, is it obvious how they can make things happen? I think you know, there's an interesting point here. I think it comes back to the, the question that was posed to start this panel itself, which is, why is climate change so hard? I think it's interesting that we're framing the question in this way because it implies, and I hear this repeated all the time, this kind of mode of thinking. It implies that, um, you know, change in history stems from people changing their minds, people with a kind of neutral relationship to, to knowledge and to ideas, um, gaining more information and then, you know, changing their minds and changing the way that they behave, right? It's, um, it's an idealist in, in a kind of Hegelian sense way of understanding the world. In, in the sense that, you know, it's easy to believe that, that history is driven forward by ideas rather than what um, a materialist would suggest, which is that it's driven forward by, by struggle and by power, basically. I think this is really the central point here. And the answer to the question as to why climate change is so hard is because it's not supposed to be easy. There is a coalition of interests uh, that um, have, uh, you know, a, a really keen interest in the maintenance of the status quo as it currently stands. Um, and as much as central bankers are, like Christine Lagarde, like, you know, the, within the Bank of England at the moment, there is a very live debate as to um, how uh, asset purchasing programs, so, you know, ever since the financial crisis, central banks have been creating money to purchase assets, uh, some of which have been government bonds, other of which have been kind of private bonds, so as in uh, indirectly lending to corporations. And they've done so based on a, a kind of fairly narrow remit of financial stability, um, whereas actually, you know, climate campaigners have said, well, no, you should be only purchasing assets that um, have a kind of neutral or positive impact on, on the environment. And um, so there's a, there's a live debate there, certainly. Um, but I think what's interesting is rather than kind of looking at this in an abstract way and saying, well, what are the ideas? What's right? What's wrong? What do we know? What do we not know? And why is it it's so puzzling that people aren't acting on the knowledge that we have? actually looking at the layer beneath that, thinking, well, what are the constellations of interests that exist to ensure that the system continues to run as it is? And just briefly on that, I think there's a, um, an interesting uh, little, I don't know, it's not really an anecdote, kind of story about uh, um, our discovery of the, the kind of phenomenon of climate change. Because of course, uh, large corporations, for example, ExxonMobil, had their own scientists investigating um, what they then called the kind of greenhouse effect way back in the 60s and 70s and they came up with some pretty strong evidence that uh, climate breakdown was, uh, was was going to be a result of continuing to burn fossil fuels. Now those corporations did not presented with these ideas go out to the world and say oh look we've had this new information let's change the way we do business. Exxon actually buried that information they drastically cut the research budget for their internal scientists and then they used the profits that they're generated from selling fossil fuels to fund climate denialism. And then ultimately we get to a situation where we have Donald Trump in the White House and the former Exxon CEO uh, working as his energy secretary. So yeah, I think, you know, the, the implication that we should be puzzled as to why this is a difficult fight is a troubling one for me but, because it implies we're not focusing enough on real relations of power. I think the history of, of the extent to which the fossil fuel companies have influenced the way we perceive the issue, influenced the media, it, it is well known and, and, and uh, written about. But don't you think that that coalition is perhaps changing when you get uh, Joe Biden campaigning with a, a really lengthy green manifesto, Boris Johnson putting out his 10 point green plan? Perhaps all the problems aren't solved, but, but are the, the players in the coalition perhaps shifting? 
and this is what I think is actually interesting at the moment. And, and you know, this is really what, what the, the kind of shift that we're seeing um, at the level of kind of elite discourse comes down to, because there is a kind of split within, um, you know, capital essentially within uh, the private sector as to where we should be going next on climate change. Now, there is a level of, um, there remains a, a, a kind of um, level of, uh, optimism among some sections of, uh, of the ruling class who believe that it is going to be possible to kind of create some form of green capitalism, right? Uh, and these uh, kind of progressive elements of um, uh, that class coalition can be found in certain parts of the central bank, they can be found in certain uh, parts of the state, in certain parts of our political parties, and they are supported by, you know, a particular section of the private sector. So, you know, there is a now a burgeoning um, green energy sector. Um, as well as kind of elements of, uh, of private enterprise, which would see their profitability significantly decimated by, by capital, uh, by, by climate breakdown, sorry. Um, and indeed, you know, when you look at this over the long term, then you could say, well, really, I mean, capitalism is not going to be possible unless we actually start taking some, uh, some really significant actions on climate change. But again, you know, we always see this, the, the crises of capitalism tend to take the form of collective action problems among different capitalists. So whether you're thinking about, for example, the problems associated with um, effective demand, which was really a problem of, you know, if everyone paid their workers properly, then there would be more demand in the system and more goods would be sold. But any one individual firm doesn't have an incentive to pay their workers any more than another firm. How is that solved? Via the state through the mechanism of Keynesianism. Today, we have this collective action problem of every firm, indeed capitalism in the world as a whole, is going to be significantly negatively impact by climate breakdown. Um, but there are certain interests who would see their profitability decimated so much that it doesn't make sense to try and act now. Okay. So it really does again fall to the state and to the interests that, that are behind that, um, that, that coalition to start pushing for this kind of form of green capitalism. The question is, is it gonna come quickly enough? Are these collective action problems going to be resolved in a way that is, is just and facilitates sustainability over the long run? That's a massive point, and I want to come back to it, and I want to unpack it some more, but I just want to talk about the media for a moment. Richard Betts, how would you look back on your relationship with the media over the years and the influence that the media has had on climate change and the reporting of climate change? So <clears throat> clearly the media has had a, <coughs> excuse me, a huge influence. Um, not always a good one, sometimes a good one, depending on who, who, uh, yeah, who and which outlet and, uh, and so on. And it has changed over time. Um, the, I guess one, one sort of fundamental thing, um, which, which Chris might be sort of interested in, has probably sort of set up this kind of thing himself, is that this, the media tends to make the dis dis discourse rather polarised. Either it's about uh, the latest scientific finding, which shows we're even more doomed than we, than we thought we were before, or it's complete denial uh, of the issue. There's very little room for nuance very often, unfortunately. Um, so that's, um, that makes things harder when, it, when it's sort of you know, quite a complex uh, uh, problem. Um, but I mean, I, I guess it's always good to, to make sure that, that these, yeah, the conversation is happening and it's in the forefront of people's minds. So I am pleased when I, when I see more and more reporting of uh, climate change in, in a way which is you know, true to the science and, and, and not denying the reality of, uh, uh, of climate change. Um, which has been an increasing, has been a problem in the past, but is less of a problem now, at least in the UK media, but it hasn't gone away by any means. Uh, there's, there's still lots of you know, untruthful reporting about climate change, has to be said. Krista Mayer, what do you think about this, this idea? It, is it a polarisation issue? So certainly uh, the, the, the diverging messages that Richard referred to have created a situation in which there is now an enormous spread of public opinion ranging from a small percentage of people, at least in the UK, who think that there isn't a problem or that nothing is happening, but it's just a few percent left anymore, mm. to people who think that in 10 years time we'll all be dead. And that's specifically amongst young people, like kids, school kids, that that um, is becoming more and more of a problem that children are saying, we don't have a future anymore, it's too late, we're gonna be all dead in 10 years. Mm. And of course the science isn't saying that. Now, where reality lies, is not, it's not a fixed point, because the decisions that we're going to be making in the next 10 years, 15 years, are going to massively determine where on that scale of how bad things are going to be, we're going to end up. 
So um, whereas that, that wide diversity of, of views on how bad things are going to be, they're, they're causing a lot of problems and not just for the perception of climate science itself, but also for determining what the correct course of action is. Because if you're at the extreme end of thinking that we're 10 years away from societal breakdown or from the end of the planet, uh, that some people think, then you want the most drastic action ever. If you're much more in the sort of towards the center of that, of that spread of opinion, then you might be much more inclined to make smaller changes to the system. And, and so we're, we're in a situation where, at least in the UK and in European countries, the main fault line is not anymore between those people who are rejecting the science, who are rejecting that bad things might be happening in the future, but the main fault lines are now starting to emerge between different groups of people who want different types of action. And so that then actually, instead of s sort of um, driving things forward, could become a drag on our ability to actually deliver sensible action, because we're now splintering, fragmenting in different groups, and we're not sort of trying to, to solve this together. We're all pursuing our own vision of what the right course of action is. And we're butting heads with people who want something else from what we are. Richard Bev, so you were nodding there. Is that, is that an issue for you? Do, do you see that as an issue? It is. I, I, uh, as Chris said, I do see uh, an increasing uh, sort of a, um, level of thinking that somehow uh, all is lost. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, we, we, we cannot, uh, can no longer avoid the worst, uh, which is not true. And if I was, I was, there's, there's a comment in the chat I wanted to come back to, which, which speaks to this, uh, about, uh, and Chris mentioned the you know, 10 years till doomsday kind of idea. The, the 10 years thing is, 10 years is when we could be seeing global warming reaching 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial, um, which is the sort of, yeah, the, 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 the aim of the Paris Agreement is to try and limit warming to to that level, or you know, not too far above it. Um, and uh, that's because when you start to go above that, that's when the sort of the impacts start to become really severe. But it's not like a hard flip uh, in the system. The system is not going to suddenly change at that at that point. Even if we do fail to meet that target, it's still worthwhile uh, reducing the um, climate change uh, beyond that. It's not a point of no return. Um, and that's, that's the key thing. Um, so there's, it, things often get oversimplified. And the, previously they were oversimplified in terms of people claiming that climate change wasn't a problem. Now they're getting oversimplified in terms of the, uh, the imminence of the problem and the, the, which, which can be counterproductive. It can actually be counter to action if we think all is lost. Christopher, but if, if we're talking about it, if it is on the agenda, if we're fearful of it, isn't that the point at which it becomes a political agenda? We start voting according to our fears, according to what we're worried about. Fear doesn't, um, doesn't persuade evenly. Fear polarizes. Fear is part of the reason of why we are sitting in a polarized space. Um, because if you are exposed to a scary message, you can respond in multiple ways. One is that you say you believe the fear and you say this is really scary, this is going to be terrible. Another one that is that you believe it, but the fear is too much and you turn away, you switch off and you become indifferent to the problem. And the third one is that you say they're trying to scare me, but I don't believe it and they're doing it for their own reason. And then you become a, a climate skeptic and a climate denier. And so the fear messaging has been partially responsible for creating the polarized situation we're in. It's not the only factor. Of course, there, are, there is a confusion and the miscommunication that comes from certain organizations and players in the field, but it certainly hasn't, hasn't helped. And this idea that, that fear drives action, in, from my perspective as a neuroscientist, is not right. Mm -hmm. For me, action drives our understanding of things. So usually in everyday life, we change our beliefs, we change our understanding, we, we, we get emotional responses when we're taking action. Emotions are the consequences of behavior. They're not the drivers of behavior, or let me rephrase that, they're very unpredictable drivers of behavior. So if you scare one person, they might leap into action, the type of action that you want, but another person might turn away from your message altogether. And, and so this is one of the things that I've been 
uh, pushing more and more in the last two years or so is that idea that beliefs lead to behavior change is mistaken. We need to start from actions and that will get people uh, to understand and to become aware of the problem and so on and so forth. So actions drive beliefs is my strap line for 2020, basically. <laughs> Before we before we circle back to the economic questions with uh, Bob Pollan, uh, Catherine Butler, if I can just bring you in on this on this question of fear and how we um, kind of make people act or how we perhaps change voting patterns. Uh, Alison asked, how do you suggest we make the need for action to limit climate change more relevant to those with other priorities currently? Fear, it doesn't seem, Chris doesn't think is necessarily the best way. Um, I think on, on this, what, uh, one approach we've taken in, in research in the past was to, rather than focusing on the problem of climate change, to focus on the solutions. Because while there is a lot of division around uh, the problem of climate change, and that's partly owing to its complexity, um, there is a lot of agreement um, around the um, positive uh, kind of agreement around the solutions. So, um, although obviously there are uh, divisions there too, but if you take something like renewable energy, in the UK, for example, you have 85% of people across or around between 80 and 90% of people um, sort of across the UK always coming back with positive, highly positive uh, responses to, um, uh, to renewable energy and uh, across different kinds of sources. Mm. So if you focus on the solutions and actually even it focus on them at local levels as well. So what people can do positively in their local communities, I think that's a much stronger way forward um, on climate change and for getting action than it is um, sort of relentlessly focusing on what the problem is. Um, I think so. I think that, yeah, that would be my, my take on it. To focus on the solutions, not the problem. Bob Pollan, then, let's be a little bit positive. Uh, Grace Blakely was talking about the kind of uh, political and economic change she thinks might be necessary to actually put climate change on the agenda. But something that always interests me is if you believe that really profound economic change is necessary, do you make it harder for people to engage with the issues, the fundamental issues of climate change, because they may be turned off by the particular economic agenda you want to pursue, one that they perceive as being anti-capitalist? Is it easier, if your priority is the climate change, to try and work with the system that we have? Well, first of all, I think we have no choice to work within the system that we have, because this is the system we have, and it's not going to change fundamentally in a matter of 10 years uh, or 20 years. So the, the point would be then to focus on the things that we need to do that we can change now. And that can lead to a transition to a much more egalitarian society within the context of a climate stabilization path. So for example, uh, Catherine mentioned the positive view that people have of uh, renewable energy. So in my view, there's a lot of things that need to be done, but the, the, the most critical things that need to be done to stabilize the climate is to transition the energy system off of fossil fuels, stop burning fossil fuels, and start uh, investing in high efficiency and clean renewable energy sources. Now, when we do those two things, they have uh, positive impacts beyond their impact on emissions. Number one, they generate a lot of jobs. So it is a big source of job creation. And a lot of the things I'm working on right now in the US at various states is to demonstrate even in the, state, the Appalachian region, which is very heavily dependent on the fossil fuel industry, to show them that actually you create more jobs by transitioning to clean energy versus maintaining the fossil fuel industry. Now, of course, that does not create jobs in the fossil fuel industry. And it certainly is not good for fossil fuel capitalists. Um, that's, uh, we, that's the critical thing is the just transition for the workers and communities to move the people who are now dependent on the fossil fuel industry into other activities where they can sustain their lives and their communities can build, be built back up. And the investment in clean energy is gonna be a driver creating those opportunities. Now, that can also then be seen as a way through which we transition out of the ver variant of capitalism that prevails now, neoliberal capitalism, into a more egalitarian capitalism, which is focused on equality, job creation, uh, just transition, and environmental sanity. So I think those are the, that's a positive message. I would also add, 
investing in clean energy now will deliver cheaper energy. Let's say you don't care at all about climate change one way or another. All you care about is how much you pay for electricity. If you invest in high efficiency and you invest in renewable energy, you will get cheaper electricity because right now, thanks to China in part, uh, right now, renewable energy is at cost parity. Unsubsidized, it's at cost parity on average with uh, fossil fuel energy. But do you feel then optimistic? Because you make that really important point about, despite the Trump administration's view of climate change, many of the, the changes at state level continued during his administration. Uh, and that change, that move away from fossil fuels has continued. Isn't that a, a moment of optimism, there a reason to be optimistic? Uh, well, since Grace was quite, uh, quoting Hegel, I'll, I'll quote another <laughs> great thing. I'll quote Gramsci. Uh, my, one of my favorite quotes from Antonio Gramsci is, pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will. So uh, I don't really, you know, I, I don't see the point in just being optimistic. I think we have to assume that things are where they are, but be optimistic in the way you, uh, you fight for things that you want. But it, it is true. Look, California is, I, the economy of California is roughly the same as the UK. Uh, this is a big place. And the entire state of California is way committed on the climate issues relative to what we hear out of the uh, soon to demise Trump administration. So that is a very favorable development. Grace, Bob won't let me chivy him into the optimistic camp. He's going to keep that uh, little bit of pessimism and cynicism going. But I wonder, do, where do you stand then on this in terms of how much the system is changing? Uh, we're seeing divestment from fossil fuel companies and movement towards, uh, to, towards renewables, not just uh, in Europe, but in many parts of the world. Isn't that a, re a reason to be optimistic? to remember that the climate crisis is bound up in a whole set of other crises um, that we are facing today and that tackling climate breakdown requires um, recognizing the way in which it intersects with all the other issues that are threatening the kind of integrity of the, the kind of global economy uh, today. So it intersects with the problem of inequality. I thought it was interesting um, the way uh, the, the, we were talking about this question as, you know, are we optimistic or pessimistic? Do we think that, you know, climate change isn't going to happen or is going to happen in 10 years and that'll be that? Again, you know, this question, um, it needs to be analysed from a, from a political perspective, i.e. bringing in power dynamics. So climate change, as I, I mentioned, is disproportionately caused uh, by those at the top. Uh, the kind of main, maintenance of the system that we have now is in the interests of uh, a lot of the kind of largest companies and, and wealthiest individuals in our society. But it's also worth pointing out that the way in which climate change experienced differs depending on your class position. Um, so it's all very well saying, you know, if things are going to be, be fine, we'll do the Green New Deal. And then, uh, you know, the UK isn't going to be underwater and California isn't going to be consumed by wildfires or it will be, but it won't be as, as bad as it could have been. Whereas actually a lot of the, the most significant impacts are going to be felt by people in the global south. Um, so by uh, people who are, uh, you know, in regions that are a threat of desertification, like in the Sahel, uh, island nations, for example, that are particularly a threat of, of rising sea levels. And so again, you know, this question of climate change affecting some people more than others brings in this question into that question, which is, well, are we optimistic? Optimistic for who? Um, I think, you know, it's perfectly conceivable to imagine a form of kind of green capitalism that basically sacrifices large parts of the global economy in order to maintain profitability uh, in certain sections of uh, the global north while pursuing some sort of uh, you know green capitalist agenda that doesn't really involve this set of, of, of social missions to decarbonize but is more based on kind of carbon taxation um, and therefore doesn't really account for any of these problems of kind of inequality and, and representation that overlay this issue of, of climate breakdown um, but uh, and, and I think the reason for that, again, and, and this is actually something that, um, that I think is important to bring into this, the, the conversation at this point, is that when we're talking about how we achieve some of these things, we're talking about the kind of coalitions that we need to build in order to push back against this kind of form of extractive capitalism, and whether or not that is compatible with a new kind of capitalism, 
or whether it would actually give rise to a system that is so structurally different to the kind of economic system that we have now that we'd have to call it something different. Mm. It's worth remembering that Keynesianism, so, you know, brown Keynesianism rather than the green Keynesianism of the New Deal, the reason that um, it ultimately kind of came a cropper in the 1970s and 80s was because it increased the power of working people too much relative to capital. Uh, unions became too powerful. The working classes kind of gained too much influence over government because there was all the there were all these mechanisms designed to prevent unemployment and those sorts of things. So what did we see? We saw an organised set of interests from within the capitalist class push back against that, destroy it, and replace Keynesianism with neoliberalism. Well, and they that would argue that, that, that they also know. promoted growth and they created a situation in which more jobs were made. Krista Mayer, or, um, Grace Blakely makes a very, very powerful argument there, but one that would be challenged by many on the right. Uh, do you think that that attachment of that kind of agenda actually makes it harder for green issues to be accepted? It makes it green, green issues, climate change, it helps to polarise the issue. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a very complex issue, that, of course, that we're talking about. But I guess that I, I've got a different view from Grace, I think, on some of these things. And, and for me, this isn't just about people... To me, everyone who has who takes a, a strong position in this debate or or within that system of of protecting their the, the the status quo that they have or or changing wanting change or whatever, do so because they really believe in what they believe in. So Friedman really believed in what he believed when he pushed his neoliberal um, uh, theory of freedom, and and that brought about all of these changes that Grace is talking about. That then look like a destruction of um, a certain um, sort of uh, Keynesianism that was taking place at that moment. Um, but where it to me, it's the thing is that people aren't willfully going for seeking out problems. The the, the people who are being the drag on climate action being delivered aren't willfully pursuing the destruction of the planet. That's not their aim. They are just coming at this with a different set of beliefs and a different worldview and a different perspective in which certain things that on the left of the political spectrum are being spoken about as a solutions to the climate crisis aren't recognized as solutions. And, and, and then people start to question the problem and they say, oh, there isn't a problem. We don't need to wreck the whole system because um, I don't see, even see there is a problem. And so that's kind of how it works psychologically. It then sort of comes together in all of these political structures that we're talking about. But psychologically, people convince themselves of the beliefs they have in order to not see, look to themselves as hypocrites. We're not wanting to be hypocrites to ourselves. And, and so one thing then to think about this differently from these power struggles is to think that we're in the current situation not only because of power struggles or whatever or because of greed of human beings but also because we've been successful in solving the problems in the past there are now nearly eight billion people on the planet because in the past we have solved a lot of problems that prevented us from becoming eight billion people and and we, we discovered antibiotics and sanitation and and solved a lot of social development problems and population started to rise and with it started to rise uh, wealth and, and energy use and we're now sitting with a new set of crises that come out of us being successful at solving the crisis from the past. And for me it's not then simply a question between optimism and pessimism or power struggle but one where if we are going to be successful in solving these current crises that we're having and the current problems that we've created for ourselves then we're going to come through that and we're going to get to a space where things will be better. If for some reason we don't manage to do it because we, the problem is too big and it happens too fast, then we might go back in time. We might go back to the Middle Ages or wherever uh, we would end up in, in, in the near future. Um, so yeah, that's a different, uh, a different view on it, I think. It's one where that, that agency is such an important driver in, in that even within the people who are currently being a drag on action, if they find their way into this, if they see, okay, this is how I could become an agent of change in this, then we might still be pulling through despite the power structures that we have today. 
Okay. Uh, Richard Burtz, I want to pick up on another point that Grace was making, and she was talking about uh, the fact that climate change may affect the poorest much more than it affects the richest. Mm. Do you think, though, when it comes to the sort of negotiations that we've seen at Paris or wherever, the previous sort of UN negotiations, that the old colonial relationships affect the way in which countries behave and how they negotiate. We certainly saw new alliances emerge, didn't we, between the global south and against, if you like, the EU and, and America in the past. Yeah, that's quite an interesting one. Yeah, the kind of the, the, the geopolitics of the of how the uh, negotiations play out. The, so the, the, the 1.5 degree target from the Paris Agreement was brought about because of this coalition of uh, you know, small island states and, and, and developing countries, uh, which many of which happen to be um, in areas which are already at the threshold of uh, uh, yeah, high temperatures and so on. So hot, hot, dry countries, areas which get a lot of uh, flooding and, uh, and low lying coastlines and so on. So that, so it was that coalition which actually did drive, yeah, largely drive the agenda. Um, I think, uh, there's probably kind of international corporate cooperation outside of individual governments uh you know so scientists and activists are working together globally uh, i think uh, so i would see that there's perhaps more cooperation there than, than you might see if you just look at it uh, at a kind of a country level i think mm -hmm. i i wonder uh robert pollen if if you see that as a kind of a an idea that we need to think about rather more the way in which different countries come to the table and, and negotiate? Well, I think, first of all, we have to recognize that fundamentally the problem of climate destabilization has resulted from rich countries industrializing, and they are almost entirely responsible for the problem. It's true now that China is the biggest emitter, but that was not true for the previous 150 years. So I think we should uh, assume that the rich countries will be the primary source of financing for uh, green transitions throughout the world. Um, by any standard, minimal standard of fairness, I think that's uh, required. Um, I mean, I myself was in Puerto Rico right after they suffered from their two massive hurricanes that wiped out 90% of GDP in the country and 10% and of the population has has migrated. So this is, and this Puerto Rico is actually a fairly high income, small island uh, colony. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that we have to assume that rich countries will be the primary source of public uh, financing. And uh, I also agree that the most severe impacts are going to be, have been, are going to be on low income people and low income countries for the simple reason uh, that they have fewer resources to protect themselves against it. So that also has to be taken into account and we have to commit. I mean, uh, if we think about Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, investing in green energy, it, it can be totally transformative in that 40 to 50% of the region, the rural regions have no electricity right now. They still don't despite what politicians have been promising for generations. So if we think about building a green energy distributed small scale energy infrastructures in uh, rural Africa, that is going to be transformative in terms of the raising living standards. And it does not entail investments by big capitalist enterprise. It can be small scale, it can be cooperative enterprise. We're seeing that, for example, right now in Alaska, we have been seeing it, of all places, uh, rural areas in Alaska where there's almost no sun a lot of the year, building up uh, small scale green energy infrastructures with a combination of, of, of solar, wind, geothermal energy. So that to me is, is the development that I think can deliver a rising well-being and address the problems of low income communities. And I would also just add that any kind of carbon tax that does not uh, entail redistribution uh, is going to be massively regressive, You're going to hurt poor people the most. And so we saw what happened in France when uh, Macron imposed the carbon tax saying, I have to save the planet. And then the people in France said, yeah, but we have to put food on the table. 
Mm. So uh, the, the carbon tax is an okay idea as long as there's redistribution uh, rebates associated with it. We've only got a few minutes left. I'm going to try and get to a few of the audience questions. Um, this is one for you, I think, Richard Betts. Irene mm. says, has fighting the COVID pandemic, where people are traveling more by car and less by public transport to stay safe, set back the green agenda and allowed governments to make green actions less urgent? I think you, you could argue that either way, to be honest. Um, uh, to, on, on, to what extent, uh, yes, uh, they, they, it may be harder now because people are, are, are more worried about um, uh, yeah, uh, going on tra public transport and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on if, if they, they don't want to be exposed to infection. So they're more inclined to use private cars. On the other hand, a lot of people have discovered um, the, the, the benefits and, and, and joys and practicality of uh, cycling and walking uh, and so on, uh, and find that they don't have to travel uh, so much or in the, in the ways that they used to. So um, I think it's a bit early to say which way the influence is going to be. Uh, I think we've all learned a lot through this, through this uh, uh, pandemic, um, but I think we, yeah, how it will actually play out uh, it, it uh, will, remains to be seen, I think. I hope okay. that we will have learned the right thing. <laughs> Chris, one for you. Honor asks, what do you think the potential for engaging and mobilizing the over 65s on climate change is? Is enabling the legacy mindset a viable lever for action amongst this relatively time and financially wealthy group? Well, that's a really nice question. Um, I would say yes, it, it's very necessary. I think a lot of talk is um, in, in sort of science communication and, and specifically climate science communication and engagement is around engaging underserved audiences. And with that, it's usually meant people who are in less privileged situations, but we're actually not reaching the ones who really have the largest carbon footprints and who are spending the most money. So, um, in, and, and one group in that could indeed be the so we're over 65s. And I think there are ways to do that. And, and for instance, I'm working with the National Trust. Um, heritage is one thing that could bring that group in. Working with the Church of England, um, there are certain parts of the over 65s who are very active in the church. So it's about bringing them in in the, in the right community context. It's not one demographic, but it is find the right community context for each group that you're targeting and then um, target them within that context that they have their own interests, their own passions, etc. Catherine, one for you. Belinda, who's a local councillor, says, what's the best way to get the leadership and legislative change we need? For example, to decentralise the energy sector and enable the planning system to compel the housing and construction sector to build, improve and retrofit zero carbon homes. Who should talk to whom, I guess, is the, is the question. Wow, that's a huge question. Um, what's the best way to get to get government to act, I guess, or to get mm. um, things happening? Um, I think actually the, the grassroots uh, movements have had a have a big impact in the last. So in 2019, we saw lots of protests and lots of action on climate change. And um, I saw, I think, myself, lots of um, climate emergencies being declared in local councils, in universities, for example, University of Exeter. And that has actually galvanized and driven a lot of act action at the institutional level. Um, so I think um, it's a combination of things. So I think absolutely grassroots action is having an impact and that needs to continue. Um, and I think once you've got those um, sort of relatively seemingly small mechanisms in place of declaring things like climate emergency um, taking this it does actually have um, quite a big impact then on what happens within those organizations and institutions and then linking up and that is coming from a yeah a more localized level so um, you would expect to see uh, more kinds of sort of decentralized energy and things coming out of that because of where it's coming from. It's not coming from national government. Um, and I think actually that happening from that, that sort of groundswell of climate emergencies across the country, then actually galvanize national government as well. So I think these things um, sort of interlink together. Um, and yeah, hopefully that will continue to push action forward. Grace, we've got a minute left. I'm going to pick on you for this one because you look like the youngest person on this panel, which may be totally unfair. And I'm sorry if I'm being rude to anybody. But somebody says, and I've lost the question now, but the gist of it was, it was, it was how should young people be navigating their lives in a meaningful way in the light of such existential threats? That's from Ed Whittingham. 
This is such an important question, and I think it comes back to some things that the other panelists have been discussing. I was doing a talk not long ago about, you know, um, kind of political economy, economic reform, uh, economic justice, and I was approached by um, someone at the end, a young person who came up to me and said, what's the point of all of this? Um, you know, socialist candidates who are promising real radical action on climate breakdown have lost all these elections. We're doomed now. There's no point. My future's gone. Your future's gone. We may as well give up. Um, and yeah. I really had to, I, I, it was quite, it was really quite shocking, shocking because the emotion was clearly very genuine. Um, but I think, you know, that is a part and parcel of a much broader set of issues, which is that in the kind of highly individualistic society that we live in, we're encouraged to think of these issues as uh, segmented things that we can combat ourselves. Whereas actually the only real route towards any form of social change is through solidarity, is through collective action. Um, and it's through kind of working together to build a better world. Um, and I think that by telling him that and that it was through organizing that we were going to get the changes that we need, that he uh, seemed slightly less pessimistic. But we'll see. <laughs> well, I hope you gave him some hope anyway. Well, our collective action this evening has been to chat together, to answer questions. I think it's been really, really interesting. Please do answer the little poll that will have uh, uh, popped up on your screen right now. We'd like to know who you are, what you thought of this event. I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's been really, really good. Thank you very much to all of our panel uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, there are many more Futures 2020 events happening tomorrow online and on radio. Do have a look at the Agile Web website for these and other things happening across the year. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>